from that one, let's actually talk about um Brendan Shaw funnily enough doing a fucking U-turn on the whole Francis and Garno shit. I felt like again, this is a really weird hot tech for me, but I legitimately felt like Brendan was kind of questioning Francis and Garno's intelligent because he's African, because he speaks English with an accent, and because he's a big black guy. I legitimately think so. Because for some reason he couldn't comprehend why Francis Ngannou was maybe approaching his negotiation with you know different you know MMA organizations differently than other people. He wasn't just looking to secure the bag. He wanted to fulfill these other stipulations about getting his opponents a guaranteed purse, um, getting himself a board in the seat, getting himself a seat on the board, you know, having some options that he can maybe pursue once he kind of hangs up his gloves and shit, you know, stuff that maybe not your general fighter would be into. And like I said at the top of the show, I think if you watch Francis Ngannou's first interview with Ari Hawani, regardless of whether or not you think he should be doing what he's doing or not you could respect and understand his perspective of like cool he's approaching it from a very very different point of view he's really walking the talk he's really kind of backing you know himself and trying to kind of look out for fellow fighters by making sure they've got a purse secured trying to look after the the in the future maybe or potentially of mma and whatever else in africa and having his career prospects kind of lined up once he hangs up his gloves knowing how brutal the sports are um you know having an option to do boxing at the same time all these things he wanted to do but none of it really concerned money it was all stuff that was kind of outside of the purview of just fighting in the octagon and brendan couldn't wrap his head around it and legitimately i think a lot of it was kind of weirdly dog whistly type racist type stuff because i don't think he would have said the same thing if that was some white dude doing a deal with fucking caa or wme in my opinion i don't think so it came across a bit strange and i'll play the clip for you of what he's speaking about but let's look at his 360 and he looks absolutely ridiculous he's got this fucking um onesie on that looks a little bit too tight because obviously he bought this when he wasn't you know sipping on wicks whiskey wig ski every single day but this is brendan shaw now deciding to be um you know france and Gano's friend and talk about and kind of congratulate him for the deal in general no shame this guy absolutely no shame let's play the video brendan can we get your reaction on francis signing with the pfl francis news is finally announced it's a long time who's the guy behind the camera is that the new bgl r.i.p bgl Put R.I.P. B. Joe in the chat. R.I.P. B. Joe in the chat. Coming. I think the great Chael Sonnen broke this a few weeks ago, so it shouldn't be too shocking to anybody. But Francis signed with the PFL. Shout out to Francis Ngano. He said what he was going to do. He set out what he was going to do. You got a lot of hate, a lot of pushback. Yeah, a lot of hate from you. You fucking redact. His agent, uh, Markel, and him got it done. Don't forget Markel. He was a big advocate getting Francis to kind of go on this path that hasn't been done before. Shouts out to them. Francis, Markel, uh, the PFL for taking a chance on Francis. All of it's all good. Biggest contract. Guarantees his opponents of $2 million. He gets a portion of the gate. Pay-per-view percentage. Guaranteed money. It's completely game-changing for the sport MM MMA. So what's your issue then? What's your issue then? That's amazing stuff. You talk about people having, fighters having a union, pushing for more equity, pushing for more ownership. What is the issue then? Fair enough. Like I said, if you're selfishly a fan of the UFC and MMA or a fan of heavyweight fighters in general, not seeing him fight for another year is going to be a bit of this, a bit disappointing, especially seeing what John Jones did moving up. You're like, damn, man, what, imagine what we could have had. I understand. But what's there to hate? Let's hear. It's huge. It's massive. This is all good. My question is not with Francis. We know Francis got a great deal. So hats off to Francis. The question is, is it a great deal for the PFL? What? He never said that. He never cared about the organization he was standing with. Never. Never, this never, means- never, never, never. He was saying from number one that if Francis doesn't do a deal now, it's going to mess up his leverage, which made no sense because the more he, the longer it went, he didn't sign, the more leverage that he had. 
because he had more opportunity to say, hey, I want this. If you, if you don't give me this, I'm not going to sign. So the fact that he didn't sign with anybody, didn't give any promises, gave more opportunity to negotiate with other people. But for some reason, Brendan fought differently. Just take the bag. Just take the bag. No one's going to care about you after a year. No one's going to care about you after a year. Worst take imaginable. Let's hear him continue. Say no. The leagues that throw all this money at the fighters, affliction, other leagues, they're not around anymore. So I don't know if you can sustain a business model giving Francis all this money. Who fucking cares? He got what he wanted. This is the whole conversation. People were saying Francis was dumb and didn't know how to negotiate and he was being greedy. He proved to you that he wasn't because he got loads of shit guaranteed and given to him that wasn't necessarily the big pay deal that he would have got in other places, but it kind of guaranteed some things and put some things in place that will benefit him in the long run. That's what he got. Yes, the PFL, is it? Is it UFC? No, it's not. No one's saying that it is. Is it one championship even? No one's saying that it is either. But what he's done is that he got what he essentially wanted. People said he couldn't do it and he did that. That's what he's done. He's proved everybody wrong in that respect. All this power. I don't know if it's capable. I hope it is. I hope it works out. It would change the game forever. And shout out to Francis for taking the risk and being the guy to do it. Stop sucking also up. Also something to note. It says he won't fight to 2024. PFL is a tournament style platform. That's their business model. It's a tournament. So France is going to skip the tournament and go against PFL standards. And they're saying there's going to be a heavyweight tournament than the, the winner of that fight, Francis. I'd rather see Francis in the tournament. Other question, who's he going to fight? Name five PFL heavyweights. Go. Name five UFC heavyweights. Go. Name five one championship heavyweights. Go. The heavyweight division across the board is fucking shit. Most people can see that now, especially with the previous fight cards and stuff. Like at the top level, the lack of grappling, the lack of jujitsu and shit and wrestling overall at the heavyweight level makes it a little bit of a dead rubber, essentially. If John Jones was 10 years younger and decided to go up to heavyweight, he would dominate for a very, very long time. Come on, man. I can't name him either. So they're going to have to make PFL an attractive kind of secondary option uh, outside the UFC, which they've done because now you're guaranteeing them these huge paydays. So I think you're going to see some free agents come over to the PFL for that guaranteed payday of $2 million that Francis said is in the contract. My question again is, name heavyweights who are going to be free agents soon that you would pay to watch Francis fight on pay-per-view. So shout out to Francis, huge success. Look at this fucking backhanded fucking compliment and, you know, praise he's given the guy. When he was on his show, he was sucking him off. And now all of a sudden, because he's friends with the one championship dude, he's now deciding to fucking dismiss him and kind of, you know, give him these weird backhanded compliments. Awful, awful dude. This is definitely hater energy. He beat all the haters, beat all the criticism. Shut, it's never been done before. Hats off to the King Francis Ngannou. Why don't you say I apologize? Why don't you say that? The question is, is this model sustainable for the PFL? History would say no. Let's find out. So, in case you guys have forgotten and are not aware of what was said the first time around, I've actually pulled it up because, you know, it's good to have these receipts and just kind of go through how fucking bitter and pissed off and weird brendan sounded when he was talking about it the first time around before we do that let's quickly end the poll um regarding this joe rogan thing and let's see what you guys said in the end uh, let's get this up on screen come on so the question was do you think joe rogan's podcast is overrated like his stand-up comedy is big up to the person in the instagram comments for giving me the idea for that um poll and it says as follows the final result so far 49% of you say Joe Rogan's podcast is overrated. 38% say it's not overrated. And 12, of course, acts J. Shit. So the general consensus is most people think Joe Rogan's pod is overrated. That's pretty wild, man. I really didn't expect that, to be fair. But big up everybody that voted. I appreciate you ending the poll right now. I do appreciate every single one of you. So let's go back to the episode, right? This is the episode where Brendan essentially just can't wrap it. Look at it. Look at, look at even the fucking 
screen pause here. He's got a headache. He can't wrap his head around. Why doesn't John Africa just sign the deal? Why doesn't this big black nignog just fucking sign the deal? You need the money, right? You're from Africa, man. Africa ain't got no money. Just sign the dotted line. Come on. This is what is given. Let's hear him talk. You can go order a shirt ASAP. What's the Nechi shirt? Yeesh. Unless they sell it at the venue. I don't know how that works. Such a good dude. He's dude. He's, he's, a, he's an outlier amongst... All the, you know, the, the faces of the people that own all. So this is him sucking off the one championship, dude, right? So everything he's talking about regarding Francis and the infinite information he's gotten, he's basically exposed his source. He's so redacted, he can't even be subtle about it. You clearly know that all his information regarding the inner goings on of Francis's negotiation with one championship came directly from the CEO mouth, essentially. That's what he's doing. He's not even subtle about it in any kind of way all these fight organizations or just pro sports in general you know the commissioners of all these leagues the owners of the ufc owner of uh pfl bellator all these owners ain't no one stacks up with chatrick when you look at degree from harvard what he came from His background's none of them insane, yeah. an actual mixed martial artist mm -hmm. like trains every day has a background in mixed martial arts isn't doing this to be famous isn't doing this to make money could have sold a long time ago doesn't do that stuff he's doing it for the game his passion, yeah, that's what he said. Straight passion. Yeah. He, he's my favorite, my absolute favorite. And this is what frustrates me. You know, we shot with Chatri and Mikey on Friday. <sighs> oh, and at the time, we are talking about Francis Ngannou. And with Francis, my take on Francis right now, I'm sure it's going to be current events, so I'll jump into it right now. My, and then we'll get into UFC 288. My, mm -hmm. my take on Francis is this. The longer that it goes on, that he's not, that he doesn't have a fight coming up, the worst it is for him as far as leverage. People forget this game evolves so fast. It's not the worst take ever. How can you have less leverage if you wait longer to sign with somebody? If you're in a negotiating, if you're in demand. Fair enough if you're not in demand, but if you're in demand, if you're Francis and Ghana, you're the hardest hitting man on earth. You knock people out with a touch. People are curious to see how you're going to fare up against somebody who's maybe more grappling centric, who maybe has got more, you know, has better skills in wrestling, in jiu-jitsu, whatever it may be. People are just curious to see the matchups that you're going to have in general because it's like a freak show to see this guy get in a ring and swing wildly and try and take people's head off their shoulders. Why would you lose leverage by refusing to sign the first deal you're given on the table? That's not just giving you more. Honestly, this guy's meant to be, and this is the thing that really is disappointing about Brendan and the Shorb Show. Technically, Brendan Shorb's Shorb Show should be the best show under the Thick Boy banner because he's a former UFC heavyweight. He's a former professional mixed martial artist. This should be the best show he has. This and Food Truck Diary should be the best because this is where he's an actual bona fide expert. He's done, he's done the thing. He got into the octagon and fought other dudes. He, he knocked out some guys, got knocked out himself, right? Legitimately was ranked. Like he legitimately should be producing the best level of a show on this show. But instead, it's one of his worst. He hardly does any research. He doesn't really have any good takes. He reads the cards off Wikipedia. He does the show like hungover or high or sleepy and shit first thing in the morning which i don't understand because he's clearly not a morning person it's legitimately the worst low effort show ever and for the longest time showtime paid him for this shit look at the quality that they're doing you know brian campbell and fucking luke thomas or bc and luke as brendan calls him look at how good that show is that's on showtime that, that now took over from him he was getting paid from showtime to do the show and it was so amateur hours so bare minimum it's a real disappointment. Continues. There's other headliners. There's other big names out there. The boxing game. He he's the you know he's fun, but he's you know he's the side piece. He's not wifey. He's the side piece in all of this. So the more this goes on, and we don't hear his name in the big fights in boxing. We haven't heard for a while now. Deontay Wilder teased it, but then now he's ranked number one. So I, I don't know what's going on there. Probably fighting a big boxing name. But the longest goes on for Francis, the worst it is if you're a Francis fan. It's not good. So when Chatri, when he came in, me, me and him were talking about it, he goes, yeah, 
I'm supposed to meet with uh, Francis in L.A. He's in L.A. We've been trying to meet for a while now. Finally, we're making it happen. You know, we have, we have an offer. And he's like, money's not the issue. We can pay him more than anybody. UFC says they offer him the highest contract ever, uh, heavyweights ever in UFC. We'll destroy that. We're offering more money than he can imagine. So money's not the issue. It's these other things outside of that that makes it um, tough for us. You know, some of his demands, and it's not my it's not my place to air Chatri's details out with the negotiation. <laughs> Why are you even talking about this on air? If you've got the ear and the fucking confidence of the CEO of the of one championship, and he's telling you things behind the scenes, on the sly, in secret, why are you letting it be known that you're also speaking to him in that way? Why? Why don't you just talk around it in vague terms? The guy is so redacted. <laughs> and also, it's coming from one person's perspective. He essentially is still a promoter. So you still have to sell your organization, make it seem like you're offering whatever you're offering. You have to play the game. It is what it is. So the fact that Brendan is willing to take and believe everything the one championship guy is saying, but then doubt Bre Francis and Garner's intelligence and business acumen because he's not signing the first deal he gets is legit crazy. It's not what I do. But some of the demands that he told me that Francis made blew my mind. I was like, oh, that's the problem. Mm. There's, the, there's the problem. Now, I don't know if, I don't think it, Markel's not his age anymore. I don't know who he's listened to, um, but it's not, I'll put it this way. It's not good. Nobody is going to sign him for that. Nobody. You see what he said there? Nobody's going to sign him for that. But that video that you played, did he apologize and say, I got it wrong. I fucked up. Well done. You proved me wrong and you proved everybody else wrong. No, he didn't. He tried to kind of pretend that this didn't happen video evidence of him saying nobody's going to give him that deal it's crazy it doesn't make any sense just sign whatever you're given you've got no leverage you dumb black cunt that's what essentially he's saying i'm saying the words obviously i'm adding some spice to it but that's what it's kind of giving john africa you don't know what you're doing you don't have caa you don't have wme how can you do a deal by yourself it's impossible how can this black guy with no english do a deal by himself that's what essentially he's saying despicable nobody it's not happening so at some point he needs to get off his high horse and go, I'm still a fighter. I'm still a fighter. I need to do what's best for me. And now I know he wants to do what's best for the fighters and equal rights and all that shit with, when it comes to fighter pay, all good, dude. But what's going to happen is your voice is so much more powerful. If you want to make a change, become world champion, one championship, beat Deontay Wilder, and then keep harping on this. But right now there's not a ton of- No, that's incorrect. You always negotiate from your strongest position. The strongest position he has now is when he hasn't signed or fought anybody. There's no guarantee he's going to win all these fights. He might get sparked out by the first heavyweight opponent that he flipping is faced is matched with in in fucking PFL. He might get completely obliterated in boxing when he goes to fight Deontay Wilder or flipping you know Tyson Fury. There's no guarantees. So Brendan's telling him, sign the deal first, fight those people, win those matches, then negotiate. Are you insane? Why don't negotiate for your strongest position? You had to vacate the belt because you couldn't sign a deal with the UFC. You then go and negotiate with other organizations to get this incredible deal where you get equity, where you get a seat on the board, where you get fighter compensation, you improve the price person, sorry, the fight purse, blah, 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 blah. All of that can only be done when you don't sign. the leverage there and some of the stuff that he's asking for i've never even heard of fighters asking for ever in my entire life he's such a I've heard of some crazy shit from comics with the writers when it comes to green rooms for fighters nfl players i've heard of crazy shit you hear this like oh no he's gonna no he's gonna take that and <laughs> you hear that <laughs> let's go back there again i've heard of crazy shit you hear this like oh no he's gonna no he's gonna take that well somebody did my friend somebody fucking did Again, no putting your hands up and saying, I'm sorry, apologizing for your terrible take, apologizing for insulting his intelligence and making it seem like he's a fucking dumb black guy because he doesn't have a white man doing his business deal for them. None of that. Just good deal, backhanding compliments in that fucking romper that he's wearing that's too tight. 
And Chatri came out today and said, met with him. Uh, after careful reflection, we decided not to submit our final offer. Francis is a good guy, a good champion. I wish him continued success and happiness. Uh, at the end of the day, I didn't feel Francis and I were fully aligned on non-financial yeah. matters. That's the big one. It's nothing personal. It's just a lack of alignment. That should be alarming if you're in the Francis Ngannou camp. No, it shouldn't, though, because it means that all you need is somebody to give you the deal that is non-financial to meet those terms. The financial side of things, everybody can kind of, you know, figure out. I think the UFC probably maybe offered him more money. Maybe. Who knows? Guaranteed money, fight purse, whatever, potential. I'm probably sure they did. But it's the non-financials that he was always hung up on more. Like him, like it or not, that's what he was legitimately going for. The board seat, um, the potential to grow the sport in Africa, um, whatever else right all that stuff is the stuff that he kind of obviously the ability to um, go and fight and do boxing that he cared about more but when you're brendan all you care about is securing the bag and being able to afford to buy new luxury cars and have a bigger house then of course somebody turning on the bag can be a bit crazy but it is refreshing to see francis and garno does exist a person like that does exist i think so so already outside of pay so we know it's not pay outside of pay Francis can't go anywhere and make more money than he was going to make in one championship. So that's off the... T but he already told you he doesn't care about money. This is the thing I don't understand about this guy. Is he that dense? He already said he doesn't really care about money that much. Or he's given us the impression so far he's not really, you know, moved by money in the way other people are. So why would it matter? Table. Let's take a little break from chat. Anyway, that's it. Let's move. Um, don't want to go over it a million times. Uh, you know, Brendan's always going to do what Brendan's going to do. But again, like I said, it's just disappointing because I legitimately think that that show should be his best show, but it's not. Um, and he just kind of does the bare minimum. And, you know, it kind of shows in the show that he produces. But again, another example as to why that whole Francis and Garner thing is really important when it comes to equity and shit and giving yourself an ability to have an exit plan or a fail safe if things go wrong in the octagon is what's currently going on with fucking the UFC. Look at this. This is a post somebody uploaded on the fucking Friday Night Kid subreddit of the recent fight card. And in one of the corners, there's an advertisement here for Burt Kreischer's Machine, the Machine movie coming out soon, May 26th. They're advertising comedy based movies in the ring, octagon. And I'm pretty sure none of the money that they've made or that they've charged Burt Kreischer's team or whoever to put this ad in there is going to make its way to the fighters. So for some reason, Dana hates having ads on fighter shorts. He thinks it makes it look cheap for some reason, but he's okay splaying logos and brands all over the mat, all over the corners of the octagon and raking in that dough for the UFC. None of that money goes to the fighters, of course. So I think if you're a fighter, you should look after your best interest, whether it's financial, whether it's protecting yourself career wise, whether it's giving yourself the ability to do other things outside of, you know, MMA It's a short career, especially nowadays. You should do as much as you can to get the best deal for yourself and not listen to these absolute redax redax like brendan shaw telling you to just secure the bag go for whoever's offering you the most money and just pray for the best don't do that that's the worst thing to do personally for me but yeah big up francis and garner hopefully it works out for him hopefully it works out